civil society organizations present here, members of the media, our guests. I welcome you to today's briefing, which I intend to make it brief. Today marks International Anti-Corruption Day as declared under the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. And so today, I intend to give a little insight uh, into what has transpired and what we will be doing from next year and, uh, in respect of the suppression and repression of corruption. Ladies and gentlemen, on 24 June 2007, Ghana ratified the United Nations Convention Against Corruption which is the only legally binding universal anti-corruption instrument. In his foreword on the General Assembly resolution adopting the convention, Kofi Annan stated that corruption is an insidious plague that has a wide range of corrosive effects on societies. It undermines democracy and the rule of law, leads to violations of human rights, distorts markets, erodes the quality of life, and allows organized crime, terrorism, and other threats to human security to flourish. Unhappily, these words ring too forcefully in Ghana as corrupt practices debase our progress. And our performance on the Corruption Perception Index compiled by Transparency International has been marked by perennial underachievement. Yet, Ghana is taking remarkable steps in the quest to suppress and repress corruption. Establishment of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, the Economic and Organized Crime Office, and the Financial Intelligence Center bear testimony to this. The recent amendment of the Criminal Offenses Act under the Criminal Offenses Amendment Act 2020, Act 1034, Upgrading corruption and corruption-related offenses from misdemeanors to second-degree felonies is indicative of a reckoning of the destructiveness of corruption and a desire to stem the tide of such offenses by imposing stiffer sentences on offenders. Ghana made its most definitive statement on the strife against corruption with the passage of the Office of the Special Prosecutor Act 2017, Act 959 which came into force on 2 January 2018 and established the Office of the Special Prosecutor, OSP, as the gold standard and flagship specialized independent anti-corruption agency in pursuance of the UN Convention, with the object of investigating and prosecuting specific cases of alleged or suspected corruption and corruption-related offenses in the public and in the private sector. Recovering the proceeds of such acts by disgorging illicit and unexplained wealth and taking steps to prevent corruption. The notable advancement is that the OSP is fortified with the cure of the inadequacies of the existing anti-corruption agencies by being designed as a comprehensive anti-graft agency with investigative, prosecutorial, intelligence gathering, surveillance and counter surveillance, police, national security, and revenue generating powers. The OSP is thus a vital institution for economic development. The OSP derives its powers mainly from the Office of the Special Prosecutor Act 2017, Act 959, Office of the Special Prosecutor Regulations 2018, LI 2373, Office of the Special Prosecutor Operations Regulations 2018, LI 2374, and other laws bearing on the suppression and repression of corruption. In addition to taking its own initiative, the OSP also receives and acts on referrals of investigations of alleged corruption and corruption-related offenses from Parliament, the Auditor General, the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Economic and Organized Crime Office, and other public institutions. The office also receives and acts on complaints from private entities and individuals. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let me touch on the target persons of the OSP in its investiga investigative and prosecutorial functions. It is very important. And they are as follows. One, public officials. That is to say, persons who hold public office. That is, an office, the salaries and benefits of which are paid directly from the consolidated fund, the contingency fund, or directly out of monies provided by parliament. And an office in a public corporation established entirely out of public funds or monies provided by parliament. Second, target persons, politically exposed persons. These are persons who have been entrusted with prominent public functions in Ghana or in a foreign country or an international organization such as political party officials, that is senior political party officials, government officials, judicial officials, military officials, or a person who is or has been an executive in a foreign country of a state-owned company, or a senior political party official in a foreign country, or an immediate family member or close associate of such persons. Third target persons, private persons. And the fourth, legal persons, such as corporations, companies, organizations, associations, clubs, etc. It is important to also bring up the offenses under the mandate of the OSP. Sometimes there is some confusion as to what the OSP is mandated to investigate and prosecute or otherwise. The offenses the OSP is mandated to investigate and prosecute are classified as corruption and corruption related, and they include the following. Please take note. Dishonestly receiving property, that is, where a person receives, buys, or assists in the disposal of property which the person knows has been obtained or appropriated by a crime without intending to return the property to the owner. Extortion, that is, where a person obtains property from another person by means of threat of libel or slander, threat of prosecution for an offense, threat of detention, and any other form of threat not involving assault or harm to the person threatened. Using public office for profit. Where a public officer corruptly or dishonestly abuses his or her office for private gain, or where a private person acts in collaboration with a, a public officer for the public officer to corruptly or dishonestly abuse his or her office for private gain. This is what you call bribery. There's another form of bribery, which is corruption of and by a public officer or juror. This is where a public officer or juror, in respect of his duties of office, directly or indirectly agrees or offers to permit his conduct as a public officer or juror to be influenced by a gift, a promise, or a prospect of valuable consideration, or where another person so corrupts a public officer or juror. The other bribery offense is corrupt promise by judicial officer or juror. This is where a person makes or offers to make an agreement with another person as to the judgment or verdict which that person will or will not give as a judicial officer or juror in a pending or future proceeding. Then we have corrupt selection of juror. That is where a person procures for that person or another person to be summoned, empaneled, or sworn as a juror, or endeavors to prevent a person from being summoned, empaneled, or sworn as a juror for the purpose of securing an undue advantage or disadvantage to a party to a judicial proceeding. Then we have corruption, intimidation, and personation in respect of election. And this is very dear to my heart. Where a person endeavors to influence the conduct of a voter in respect of an election by threat of an evil consequence to be caused to the voter or to any other person on account of the conduct of the voter, or seeks to corrupt a voter or impersonate another person in respect of an, of an election. Then, one which is dearer to my heart, falsification of return at election, where a person, 
as a public officer charged with the counting of votes or the making of a return at a public election willfully falsifies the tally of votes or makes a false return of the votes. Then we have withholding of public money by a public officer. That is where a public officer who is bound in that capacity to pay or account for money or a valuable thing or to produce or give a document or any other thing up fails to do so when that person is lawfully requested to do so. Then we come to public procurement offenses. That is where a person enters or attempts to enter into a collusive agreement or influences the procurement process to obtain an unfair advantage or alters procurement documents to influence the outcome or requests for unpermitted clarification. Then we have the umbrella offenses. These are classified under the law as existent offenses arising out of or consequent upon the above offenses I have enumerated. This may be in the nature of what we call predicate offenses. These are crimes that are components of other crimes. So that is to say an offense as a result of which proceeds have been generated that may become the sub subject of any of the above offenses. Then we have linked or related offenses. These are crimes that are either way or that may be charged jointly or in the alternative. Then we have antecedent offenses. These are crimes that precede or are prior to the above crimes. These existent offenses include, let me go through them quickly, laundering of proceeds of crime, dearest to my heart. The acquisition, possession, or use of property or currency knowing at the time of receipt that such property or currency is the proceeds of crime. The conversion or transfer of property or currency knowing that such property or currency is a proceeds of crime for the purpose of concealing or disguising the illicit origin of the property or currency or of helping any person who is involved in the commission of that offense to evade the legal consequences of his or his or her action. Then the concealment or disguise of the true nature, source, location, disposition, movement or ownership of or rise with respect to property or currency, knowing that such property or currency is a proceeds of crime. Then we also have illicit enrichment or unexplained wealth. That is a significant increase in the assets of a person that he or she cannot reasonably explain in relation to his or her lawful income. That is to say, an inexplicable gap between a person's total wealth and their lawfully acquired wealth. Then we also have bribery in the private sector. We also have abuse of functions. And we have embezzlement, misappropriation, or either diversion of property or currency. Then, what is very typical in our society, influence pedal, peddling or trading and influence. Then quickly, we have obstruction of the administration of justice. That is to say, the use of physical force, stress, or intimidation, promise, offering or giving of an undue advantage to induce false testimony, the use of physical force, stress, or intimidation to interfere with exercise of official duties by a judge or a law enforcement official, and where a public officer refuses or fails without reasonable excuse to cooperate with the OSP when information is requested or lawful assistance is sought from that public officer, or where a person fails to comply with a lawful demand of the OSP, where a person fails to produce a document or provide information requested by the OSP, where a person fails to produce property or currency declared to be seized by the OSP, where a person conceals or attempts to conceal property or currency liable to seizure by the OSP, where a person knowingly furnishes false information to the OSP, where a person refuses to grant the OSP access to premises or refuses to submit to a search, where a person assaults an officer of the OSP in the performance of his or her functions, where a person obstructs an officer of the OSP from performing his or her functions, and where an officer of the OSP communicates confidential information to an authorized person or discloses the personal details of an informant to a third person without authority. The lecturer in me was coming out there. 
it is instructive to state that the OSP has the mandate to investigate and prosecute these offenses whether or not the offenses were committed in Ghana or in a foreign country so far as the act or conduct constitutes a crime in Ghana. The OSP, ladies and gentlemen, has completed a review of all the alleged cases of corruption and corruption-related offenses before it. Currently, the OSP is investigating 31 active cases, and it will, in due course, commence the prosecution in the courts of the cases it considers probatively strong. There is no case commenced by the OSP pending in the courts at the moment. I inherited one court case, that is the Republic against Mahama Ayariga and another, which I discontinued in October, after a careful scrutiny of the available evidence led me to conclude that the Republic will be unable to prove his case on the standard of proof required in criminal cases, that is, proof beyond reasonable doubt. Let me also state that the assignment and full dedication by the government of a 10-story building at South Ridge, Accra, for the sole use of the OSP and the steps taken and being taken by the Office of the President and the Chief of Staff in the establishment and maintenance of the OSP are highly commendable and a testament to a commitment to the fight against corruption. Ladies and gentlemen, assumption of office on 5th August 2021 as the second special prosecutor of the Republic, I noticed that the OSP had not been operationalized and it was without its own staff and necessary resources. The fight against corruption had, in effect, been thrown in reverse for three years. I immediately triggered the processes to set up and operationalize the office, to staff it with specialized trained personnel, and to fit it with the required material resources and equipment. By so doing, the fight against corruption has been resuscitated and we will carry on the renewed favor during my tenure in office. As the institution specifically tasked with taking steps to prevent corruption, I resolve that in the coming year, the OSP will institute and strengthen measures to prevent, suppress, and repress corruption more efficiently and effectively than has ever been done in this republic. This should portend hope that Ghana is taking concrete steps to drive down the incidence of corruption. I have commenced engagement with law enforcement and anti-corruption agencies, including the Attorney Generals, the National Security Secretariat, the Ghana Police Service, Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Economic and Organized Crime Office, and the Financial Intelligence Center. I have also opened insightful interactions and meetings with foreign and diplomatic missions and international organizations in accordance with our mutual legal assistance regime and that of the UN Convention. I have invited the participation and collaboration of anti-corruption civil society groups, non-governmental organizations, and community-based organizations, the media, and investigative journalists to support the work and operations of the OSP in our collective effort in combating corruption. I state with gratification that the response has been enthusiastic. Ladies and gentlemen, from January 2022, the OSP will institute, as part of its pressure for progress drive, an annual Ghana Corruption League table to assess perceived levels of public sector corruption in the estimation of experts and business people. In aid of this, public agencies will be ranked against each other on a corruption barometer, and the results will be published every 9 December. We have commenced discussions with the local chapter of Transparency International, that is the Ghana Integrity Initiative, which is going to be our main strategic partner on this program. Ladies and gentlemen, the OSP from January 2022 would also require all public institutions, departments, agencies, and companies to prepare and submit to the OSP integrity plans intended 
at assessing deficiencies in their regulations, procedures, policies, guidelines, administration instructions, and internal control mechanisms to determine their vulnerability and exposure to corrupt practices and the prescription of curative measures to manage such susceptibility to corruption and corruption-related offenses. I am also setting up internal control mechanisms at the OSP to prevent corruption at the OSP itself. The OSP would also carry out anti-corruption risk assessment and review from January 2020 of all major public contracts, legislation, and draft legislation. This is intended to avoid toxic deals and the prevalence of judgment debts and arbitration awards. The office would also undertake continuous education and information of the public and the publicizing of detected acts of corruption. The OSP would vigorously investigate and prosecute cases of alleged or suspected corruption and corruption-related offenses and recover proceeds of such offenses through property tracing of tainted property and currency in line with our vision of rendering corruption a costly enterprise. On another score, I look forward to the provision of adequate funding and the necessary material resources as stipulated in Article 6 and 36 of the UN Convention to carry out this most challenging and solemn mandate. I cannot help but state that without adequate funding and the provision of the necessary material resources, the good intentions of my staff and I would remain just good intentions with nothing concrete to show for it. As we mark International Anti-Corruption Day and Anti-Corruption Week, I invite all well-meaning Ghanaians, let's renew our mindsets. And collectively, let's help to turn the negative narrative of corruption to transform this republic and place it on a solid developmental track. On this call, we must draw on the wisdom of hindsight in our pursuit of a fairer society. We cannot continue on the path of see no evil, hear no evil. Let us expose the evil of corruption. Let us eschew corrupt practices as we bear in mind that ours should be a life of live and let's live in the national interest. We must transform our thinking and psyche from a ritualistic gift-giving society marked by undeserved attainment of wealth to secure and due advantage in all spheres of life to one of merit-based rewards. This is our sure chance to curb corruption, and we cannot miss this opportunity. God bless us all. God bless Ghana.